Hello. Uh, first of all, many thanks for the great opportunity to stand in front of such a vibrant community of game devs as this Austrian bunch in grass and surroundings. Huge thanks for Johanna Perker for her invitation. And uh, well, uh, it was quite surprising to find out that I'm having a keynote. Uh, uh, which, as you can imagine, left me a bit flabbergasted and uh, on the drive to Graz uh, I was quite freaking out. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh my god, uh, oh my god, the first one in the row. So, uh, let me just try my best to make it worthwhile, bring some good vibe into this meeting, pass some inspiration and maybe amuse you a little bit. Uh, well, I started uh, my game dev career as a modder for Operation Flashpoint. Actually, my first attempts were some Doom 1 modifications. Uh, later, I became a professional developer at Bohemia Interactive. And my long-term passion are virtual worlds, virtual environments. But I'm also taking care of many other aspects of the game development in uh, uh, our company. Uh, I took part mainly in the development of ARMA series from ARMA 1 to ARMA 3. Uh, some of my work appears in DAISY or uh, our recent attempt ARGO. And uh, uh, I also take part in the development of some things which are not directly seen or experienced by too many people, our proprietary terrain tools. It's due to my background in environmental science, uh, sciences. Otherwise, I'm a very passionate tourist and uh, it will show. Uh, well, uh, Bohemia Interactive, uh, in case you don't know us, is an independent Czech studio which uh, was founded by Spaniel Brothers in 1999 and debutted with uh, Operation Flashpoint, the famous sort of open world shooter. Uh, currently, we have a large portfolio of uh, unusual military tactical games, simulator games, um, also some mobile games and some lighter stuff as well. And uh, we have some like 350 employees spread in uh, seven offices across the world, including Slovakia, Thailand or Netherlands. Uh, today, I would like to speak about the additional value of games. We all make games. Uh, we know that we do have some impact on our player base, on our customers, on the recipients of our pieces of art, pieces of love. Uh, and uh, it's quite a known and uh, accepted fact that uh, games can actually teach people something. Uh, well, uh, if you look at the uh, regular game, like role-playing game or something more complex than just Tetris, uh, nothing against Tetris, it's a good game, uh, you soon realize that to effectively play the game, you can learn a lot of things. I, for example, stats and values of all the items in your favorite RPG game. It's a huge chunk of data. Uh, it can be just a fantasy world, or you can actually make people learn the real life stuff. Like this, this is the, the development uh, tree in uh, one of the civilization games. Uh, the point is, if you uh, put some real life information, some valuable uh, things, into the entertainment, people are prone to, to accepting it, learning it, embracing it. And it's actually pretty cool. Uh, this approach was pioneered by uh, Renaissance uh, uh, preacher, uh, Protestant priest uh, and uh, pedagogue John Amos Cominis. Uh, as we are the game developers, uh, I'll use some uh, contemporary terminology, so uh, his Scola Ludus, uh, translated as a school by play, uh, in fact is a DLC fixing his terribly complex book, Janua uh, Linguarum Reserata, or uh, Open Gate to the Latin Language. It didn't turn out as open as it used to be, so he uh, did not let, let his students play some games, jump in the class, anything like that. It was uh, attempt to teach them using theatrical play. 
They were doing different things while embracing the information, learning it. And uh, to these days, many of the game developers know and do that. There were purely educational attempts in the past, uh, in the past like uh, Oregon Trail, which, for example, uh, get, got you acquainted with the hardships of uh, first colonists of uh, North America. Uh, and as I was told, you, you were seeing a screen like this pretty common, as was the case in the history. Uh, except that they didn't have screens, they had just the dysenteria. Uh, there are many games which have clear roots in, uh, uh, in history or simulators which uh, use the real life or lifelike environments and controls and systems to actually teach those real life systems. And um, there are also some genuine attempts to strip some of the action games of uh, their action part and leave just the exploratory, fun, learning stuff like Assassin's Creed Origins, Discovery Tour. It's perfect. I definitely recommend you to try it. Uh, I dare say that uh, Czech developers, Bohemia Interactive included, uh, do have some special knack for this. Uh, I dare say it's our domain. Uh, the first game I really re remember passing some interesting historical facts on to me was Mafia. Uh, it, it's a movie-like uh, action experience about uh, Mafia during the Prohibition era, but it's done so well, uh, covering so many of the themes of the era, um, that part of history of uh, the United States. It's really interesting. Then Vietcong, like, uh, the game which was released two years after Operation Flashpoint, uh, it, it's been very popular. It looked like just another shooter from the Vietnam era. Uh, it was immensely popular, uh, some of you may have played it, but uh, if you look at it closer, it's not just about shooting, it's also about meeting non-combatants, learning a lot about the sides and aspects of the Vietnam conflict, which uh, simply wouldn't fit into just a shooter. The game has well encyclopedia of the war. Uh, and uh, from the recent times, a very powerful, interesting and well done experience, Attentat 1942, in which you assume a role of a young adult um, trying to uh, learn a bit about the family history related to the World War II, uh, even specifically tied to the Nazi repressions in the former Czechoslovakia um, after uh, Czech paratroopers uh, assassinated uh, one of the uh, key Nazi figures. Uh, uh, it tells a lot of interesting stories in a very interesting way. It's been developed by the Czech Academy of Sci uh, Scientists and the Charles University. Historians made this game in order to get some people acquainted with the fact that history is not black and white. And, of course, I come from Czech Republic, I just have to mention my colleagues from Warhorse and their Kingdom Come Deliverance. Come on, it's a studio with their own historical research team. Uh, they did a really amazing job to show you how the medieval times not just looked like, how they worked, how people were existing in that era. That's quite a thing. Of course, then there's Bohemia Interactive. You're the best. Uh, I, I dare say that uh, the urge to uh, project uh, some more value into our games is part of our design DNA. Uh, it's because it's easy for us. We are trying to root our uh, in-game experiences in the real life. And uh, it clearly shows in Take On series, you know, Take On Helicopters, Take On Mars, uh, actually, if you play Take on Mars, you're probably ready to start your own Mars exploration company. Uh, Islands, the game developed for kids by their clever parents, uh, like our uh, chief executive officer, uh, but uh, based and focused on teaching some real life mechanics through crafting. And obviously, I'll be talking most about Arma series. In which I, uh, in which development I took part, and 
DAISY because I was involved in the development of its environment. Uh, the way we approach finding and giving people the value has certain steps. So it's not like, hey, yeah, this is great. That's something really peculiar. We'll just put it into the game. Well, we do take inspiration in reality. Uh, we often do some really crazy things like shooting uh, high caliber sniper rifles in Hungary after uh, some, you know, some guy just invites you, hey, you can have our rifle in the game. We learned a lot about sounds and ballistic on that day. Uh, there's this inception phase during which we do the research to see whether it's really worth it, but whether it fits within the game's vision. Uh, we do various consultations about which I'll be talking later in relation to the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, uh, and we also listen to our community. You know, you make super realistic uh, military tactical game. What soldiers do when they get back from work? They probably hang the helmet on the hangar, fire up Arma, play, they see differences, they send us mail about, hey guys, you know, I just returned from work and the stuff you got there, I tried it, you got it different, please fix it, or improve it, or extend it. They're lovely. <laughs> and then there's this implementation, and uh, we are really carefully considering whether to really add a realistic feature or not. Uh, in the Arma series, uh, uh, which uh, depicts the combined operations where you can play uh, with vehicles and soldiers in the, so in the single scenario on the very large and realistic game worlds, uh, uh, we uh, found out that uh, there are several areas where Arma can really bring some additional value. Uh, first thing which we are deliberately trying to do is that, well, War is not nice. War is not a war movie. War is actually a very stressful thing and uh, ultimately we would like to make an anti-war game. Uh, we actually managed to pass a lot of information about the real uh, world militaries and about the less known features of combat. You know, there are some things which other developers usually don't care or don't need to implement. If we are going within the scope we do. So let's say several tens or hundreds of soldiers and uh, some vehicles on top of it fighting on several square kilometers at once. Things are getting really complex and to do it right we have a layer of some very complex rules over just basic combat. And above all war has rules. Soldiers have to respect and be them ideally. Uh, of course, Arma can serve as an army recognition manual. Uh, if there would be an Arma player among us, he would already start naming all the types and designations and armaments, etc. Um, but it's not really that much of a point. In Arma, you also use the in-game map for navigation, for like real-life navigation. But let me return to that in DAISY, where this feature plays a lot more crucial role than in armor. Uh, shooting and ballistics, people were amazed to see that even though they aim, uh, they, they simply don't hit the thing. They usually start complaining uh, and they either delete the game uh, or uh, they learn that we have something like ballistics, that, we, that our bullets actually do drop. So you have to carefully set your sights. It's called zeroing. The weapon is zeroed to, the, to certain distance. Uh, so we uh, pride ourselves to be one of the uh, two or three games in the world which do have zeroing. Uh, there are some information about the tracer colors ammunition which you can learn in the process like that Soviet weapons uh, have uh, not red but uh, pale green, yellow tracers, on the other hand, Americans have red ones due to the different salts they use with the phosphorus. Uh, we even uh, teach people to use these uh, strange scopes. This is PSO-1 site that you commonly used on the Dragunov sniper rifle. Since Operation Flashpoint, there was this mechanic allowing people to actually measure the distance, so 
this is the height of a uh, of human on 200 meters and according to it you just uh, corrected your aim um, uh, on this ladder. Uh, simple as that, um, people, people just like it, it's like a minigame. Uh, Sunscape, uh, it's often neglected part of, uh, of um, shooting games, military games. We are definitely trying to do it right, mostly because of uh, the distances on which we fight. Uh, so, uh, uh, I remember when we first implemented the supersonic crack, uh, I was trying to practice it to, you know, to just demonstrate it without shooting at people. I failed, so I won't do that. But uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a small uh, like uh, shock wave created by the bullet passing next to it's like a, a you know uh, this weird crack sound. People started reporting it uh, as bug, uh, except of soldiers. They were amazed. <laughs> like, uh, I, I mean, people from the uh, from the militaries who play our game. Hey. You guys have supersonic crack. Right? That's amazing. You know, um, it's a uh, uh, it's it's a thing which you don't normally know. Like because for, um, fortunately we live in times where we are not shot at, and we should be really grateful for that. Uh, of course, with the distance, we are changing volume and pitch because after all, sound is just a pressure wave. It's just changes of air pressure. So we are modulating it. Uh, if, if you are into military history, I can recommend you a book by Tom Clancy written uh, together with uh, General Antonio Zini, uh, uh, United States Marine General, currently retired, uh, uh, who described one particular memory from his career. Uh, he was stationed in Vietnam in, uh, in an adversarial role to the South Vietnamese military and he, he remembered his first combat encounter. Uh, and. Uh, he was describing exactly what the newcomers or new people experience in Arma 3 when we play together in the campaign. Right? Uh, they are completely confused and they don't know what's going on and they are just wondering how everybody else, all the exper experienced soldiers slash players, uh, are able to react to discern the direction or distance of enemy. Uh, he, uh, General Zini later mentioned that uh, he sort of like uh, learned to read those skirmishes and according to the uh, percepting the soundscape, he actually got to understand these situations a lot better uh, with the experience. So uh, the similarity was really, really striking to Arma. Uh, Obviously, Arma has night vision and thermal imaging. So, uh, for uh, for many people, uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, uh, our world looks slightly different in an infrared spectrum, or in a, um, uh, and uh, that uh, there are some interesting aspects or, uh, of of using the close infrared or uh, light amplification night vision, uh, like for example. Uh, People again started complaining when we implemented uh, the feature which prevented you to use the scoped weapon together with your night vision goggles. In, re in reality, they are simply not compatible. So that's why we were adding these uh, aiming aids, those lasers which are visible only in the night vision. Uh, but now let me focus on the main uh, thing in Arma, which is really uh, which is really pushing something important. It's the international humanitarian law or law of armed conflict, which we uh, take inspiration from in creating some additional gameplay rules and uh, uh, which has been a huge inspiration and uh, uh, influence to our work in the recent few years. Uh, this is the real, I think, regulating the conduct of armed conflict uh, and focused on mitigation of human suffering, be it soldiers or civilians. Uh, you probably have heard about Geneva Conventions. This is it. Uh, in the practice, it's far from perfect. It often doesn't work. It's often ignored. But as we were told by the ICRC representatives, it's better than nothing. I sort of like this caricature a bit because it 
illustrates the set truth that uh, it's just better than nothing but it doesn't save the world but still we believe it makes the world a bit better and it's worth uh, being inspired by it. Uh, we were even offer, uh, offered assistance by the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, we were simply asked for uh, depicting the international humanitarian law in correct context. It was a cool thing. They came to us uh, without any intention to ban or, or censor the violence. They were even telling us, ah, yeah, be as violent as possible. We, we don't care. We just need the message to be clear. We just need the correct context. If someone shoots civilian, he should be punished, as it should be in the real life, uh, etc. So uh, uh, we are applying this to sandbox rules, so the general rules governing every scenario, and to the particular scenarios and campaigns. Uh, we even got a visit from Geneva. Uh, uh, to the left is uh, Christian Rufair, uh, currently leader of the ICRC Virtual Reality Division, uh, responsible for this whole effort. And his colleague Winston, uh, who was just explaining uh, uh, something to our designers. And it was striking to see how well it was received in the, uh, in the team. And uh, even now, we discuss things and suddenly someone says, hey, what about IHL? Like, is it all right? Uh, so uh, it definitely left a trace and we believe it's something worth promoting. Uh, speaking of violence in correct context, uh, the chief concern was that the role models uh, uh, of the contemporary military games are simply doing the wrong things, like summarily executing uh, prisoners of war. You know, if there would be a war, you would be a prisoner of war, you would surrender. You don't want to be just in, uh, shot during interrogation. It's something which is bad, which is a criminal act, etc. But it appeared in the game at that time. Uh, even, even in our games, we made a lot of mistakes like this. But uh, we were willing to change. And of course, we do have atrocities in armor, but done by enemies, not friendlies. Uh, if friendlies or if player does some atrocity, he's punished. Uh, of course, uh, we translate this to the rules of engagement, like uh, contrary to a uh, more sterile, sterile environment when it's just you and enemies, we are trying to sometimes create a more complex situation in which uh, we actually <laughs> let player uh, or attack civilians, for example. Or uh, there is a chance we, we don't hard code any limitations like lowering the weapon. It's up to player to recognize. And if he makes mistakes, the game teaches him to not to do it again. Uh, uh, we have even instant punishment. You shoot a civilian or friendly and you're getting shot by your own friends. And of course, I've mentioned some complexity and ambiguity in the real life and uh, uh, speaking of rules of engagement it can really get very complex for example these are soldiers you would probably attack without hesitations if you identify them as uh, an enemy uniforms they are holding weapons it's a clearly military vehicle how about these guys would you attack them I don't think so unarmed cities just some track track but then, imagine a commander seeing this from a UAV. In the game, it can be an interesting situation. In the real life, there's a huge responsibility on the people who are pulling the trigger. And uh, this is something we, we also want to show in our games. Hey, this can be really complex and uh, you are not just scoring points, you are killing people in a real war. Uh, but I believe this makes it more colorful, more attractive and uh, more prone to be remembered if done right. Uh, ARMA also has competence identification and uh, according to the uh, humanitarian law or law of armed conflict, uh, we don't allow uh, players to play in opposite sides uniforms. It's banned by the Geneva Convention. Uh, 
We also use the protection markings. Again, in the correct context. So, uh, uh, so if you play Arma, you actually get to know that there are some protection markings used for vehicles which are there to mitigate the human suffering, so they shouldn't be attacked because they may be helping you, regardless of your sign. Uh, we were really praised by using the diamond, which has a no religious connotations as a red crescent or red cross. Uh, this is how it looks in game, and this is how it looks on personal. Uh, and uh, we are trying to be really diligent in discerning uh, combatants and non-combatants. Non in the past, even in our game, in Operation Flashpoint, there was a uh, role called Medic. The guy had this protection symbols, protection mark, and he was armed. So this is a no-go. In the, in the game, in Arma 3, we have uh, these combat lifesavers. These guys are regular soldiers equipped to uh, provide the first aid to their comrades. But uh, according to the laws of war, they can be attacked. So we are also careful about using this kind of symbology. Uh, uh, we also devoted one of our bigger efforts, uh, separate DLC, to the problem of landmines and unexploded ordnance, which is a worldwide uh, nightmare, especially in the former and current war zones. Uh, uh, these things violate so-called principle of distinction, and we were very clear about it when you start playing this DLC. You are trying to explain. Uh, principle of distinction says that if you are fighting an enemy force, you should not use any means which don't distinct these combatants, your enemies, from some innocent bystanders. So most, uh, most losses uh, in, uh, uh, to the landmines are civilian in, these, in the last years. Uh, so we took a huge effort to model various types of anti-personal mines, and then we put player on the receiving end stressing how bad it is to use these things. Now, let me speak a bit about Daisy. Uh, Daisy is a zomb zombie apocalypse survival massive multiplayer online, which started as an Arma 2 modification by uh, a New Zealand Army officer uh, Dean Hall, who later became super famous, and uh, he's now developing some more cool games with a lot of educational value, like Station Years. Uh, but Daisy was actually inspired by his first-hand experience and knowledge uh, from a survival course he underwent with the uh, Defense Forces of Singapore. Uh, uh, it, was, it was probably so, so stressful that even when he was safe in Moravian capital of Brno, <laughs> he uh, kept developing Daisy during the, during the evenings and uh, did an amazing job with it. Uh, and uh, he often mentioned that his primary uh, goal was to explore uh, the how people would react in a some you know really tough situation how they would survive how they would sort priorities so in Daisy you can actually learn a lot about survival you can also learn a lot about land navigation which is my favorite topic and you can also learn to trust no one uh, when you start playing Daisy, it's a game of lost and found, uh, with emphasis being put on the lost part. So you start in some random position with almost no equipment, and unless you used to live there for ages, or if you've played Daisy for a couple of years, you don't know where you are and you need to navigate. So you have to understand the map, determine your position, and uh, set some goals to survive and reach them. Uh, Daisy will soon again feature a topographic map similar to the one in Arma uh, with a realistic map symbology, elevation, roads, settlements, very special, special things. So if you learn to read topographic maps in our games, you can maybe dare to explore some surroundings of a big city. Uh, you know, or just leave your car for a moment and walk into in the woods. Recommend it. Uh, these maps actually work in their paper form. People were even ordering 
old map of genres when uh, the Daisy mod started being a thing. You know, for a very long time, people were facing the problem of navigating in Arma 2's big terrain, which was unknown to them because we failed to present it properly in our campaign. Uh, and so suddenly they had it all for themselves, but no one knew that. Uh, so uh, with, with no map, because it took some effort to find it, they were using paper map to navigate in the game, which was really cool. Uh, they even had some more navigation aids like compass. Uh, you can measure azimuts. Uh, you can use sun. You know, like uh, you can roughly tell. Okay, it's morning-ish, so east is that way. Maybe. Uh, but as our games also feature the star dome, stars in the night, you can use the st Stella Polaris. Uh, the polar star to determine where the north is. So all you have to do is to find the Big Dipper, which is possible in our games. Uh, this is Alpha and Beta, Big Dipper. Uh, five times this distance is the polar star, which is very close to the Earth, Earth's nor uh, northern axis. So in the night, if you get lost, or if you play Operation Flashpoint's Mission Escape, where this was actually used in the game, you can learn this whole Boy Scout trick and apply it in the game. And maybe you can try it also in real life. It works. Uh, if you can measure azimuts, you can use it for the position triangulation. So you measure azimut to hill to a house, which you can recognize on the map, and then you can pinpoint your, your position. And uh, this is how Arma 3 compass looks like. Arma 3 and Daisy share a lot. May look a bit different, but uh, yeah, you just measure as a move to this silo or something, and then to a church, as it's indicated here. And even if you don't know your position, by combining these two azimuts, you sort of determine that you are on the hill north, uh, west of the village. Sounds simple requires a little bit of training, but, you know, uh, people can do that. Uh, we also like to educate people about the different cultural uh, things, uh, so we force them to learn Cyrillic, uh, <laughs> for example. Or we like to present them some uh, geospecific and geotypical features, like uh, in Arma 3 we have uh, Tanoa, which is based on Fiji, and it really features a lot of the local local specialties. We have island inspired by Greece. Uh, we have, uh, like in this case, Armatu and Daisy is using Kenners, a fictional post-Soviet country, which is using Cyrillic and Russian. Well, have fun, learn some different alphabet. It's always, it's always fun. Of course, the Greek island has the Greek alphabet. So, so uh, you are then able to explore it beyond alpha, beta, and maybe gamma. Uh, we also borrow another really cool feature uh, uh, from the real life, and uh, uh, it's trailblazing. Uh, it's a very specific thing to Central Europe, Austria included. Uh, we just have slightly more colors. In our case, it's red, uh, red, green, blue, and yellow. And uh, there are these nice marks scattered across the Czech landscape and across channels, so you can actually use these blaze trails to navigate. And if you find a map like this, uh, even without the paper map item, uh, if you figure it out, you can use this to your advantage for your survival. As, it, as can be the case in the real life. I remember so, uh, may, uh, maybe somebody was exaggerating, but actually there were some guys uh, Daisy players who got into some hairy situation, like you know, uh, a car mal malfunction in some wilderness, and they managed to uh, uh, read environment, plan their steps, survive, navigate well. It's cool. We maybe saved a life. Uh, part of understanding environment, uh, which may be uh, too specific for most people, but it's actually very simple and uh, common sense is uh, 
uh, noticing the vegetation occurrence. We particularly try to uh, associate willow and reeds with water. Water is important, especially when you are inland in uh, uh, in Daisy. There's scarce water sources, and uh, at some point, if you need to find it, climb the hill, look around. Okay, down willows, water will be there. This is how it looks in real life. I took this picture last summer in the Bohemian Forest on the uh, on the German border, and. Uh, you can see the sweat area and probably a stream going somewhere here. Uh, and it, it's the same thing in Daisy. We are focusing on making the landscapes right. They should make sense. They should be uh, in, prone to be utilized correctly. Uh, Daisy provides perfect survival manual. So uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, Dean Hall just applied what he learned in the jungle. It's perfect. Uh, uh, just for your information, the survival priorities, which we are trying to copy for Daisy, are, well, 30 seconds uh, without oxygen, you last. Uh, three days without water and 30 days without food. So it sort of sets these priorities. And uh, in the process, you are confronted with various strange features like, you know, block types, healthcare, first aid, hunting crafting, improvisation, so uh, you, you even learn some things like that cannibalism is not healthy, you know, like uh, we are letting players eat other players, just virtually please, uh, but it uh, results in some maniacal laughter and health problems. Of course, uh, another hard uh, learned fact you can face in daisies that wet things don't burn that well. Well, if you paid attention uh, you probably learned something today as well, congratulations. Uh, but to make a point and to conclude my presentation, uh, we believe that, en uh, that entertainment can be enriched by some additional information value. It may not be just the hard facts, it can be just, well, just some context, some broader sense, it can be some experience used even for the therapy. And we believe we should focus on these opportunities further, and we will certainly be doing that. Uh, because we believe that uh, trying to add some value to a game means we can make the mechanics more interesting and make our games worthwhile for playing, more valuable, more than just play, be entertained, throw away, buy another one. So we can pride ourselves that we can take our hardcore military simulation game and use this and use it to teach school kids some real life navigation this was an event uh, annually held in one of the north bohemian cities in which we uh, don't uh, present anything violent we just let the um, let the little people roam around our virtual worlds uh, guys were using paper maps guys were uh, trying to navigate to win some merchandise. It was pretty cool. Like uh, some of them were like, hey, now I got it. Okay, so now I know how the compass works. That's perfect. So uh, let me conclude my talk with uh, uh, a little urge towards you. There's a huge power in our hands. Video games as a media is so universally accepted and played by so many people that there's a huge opportunity to, you know, push them a bit in the right way. So let's use it. Maybe there's a, another Comenius sitting in this very room. Thank you for attention. I hope it was valuable to you. And of course, uh, after, after the talk right now or during tomorrow, I'm all yours, so feel free to ask, talk. I'll be glad for that. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Um, any questions? <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, I don't know what you said, but when players get punished for shooting civilians, how do you handle the punishment in terms of immersion? Like, how uh, is it direct? It's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, every player uh, has something we call a renegade value. And uh, from the certain value, uh, uh, he's, he's becoming renegade, universally attacked by any side, including his former friends. Uh, for example, for a shooting friendly soldier, because there can be some blue on blue incident, as it's called, uh, you can inadvertently throw a grenade, damage done to your com comrades is accounted for, it's yours. Uh, so there's some, uh, there's some margin, there's some threshold. Uh, for civilians, we even change that, that, you know, you kill one guy and you are becoming uh, becoming renegade and you are being attacked. In the past it was quite funny because it was originally uh, weighted by your rank. So for example as a colonel you were able to kill several civilians unpunished <laughs> when you re realize that you are immediately changing that. And obviously, pardon, we also do some special treatment in our scenarios. Like uh, we believe that it's good to let player know that he made a mistake. In a, in a prototype scenario for some bigger battle, we, we are now trying to prototype with my colleague. We are even counting the civilian buildings which are destroyed by the artillery fire you use. Uh, current, currently it's just displayed in the debriefing, but in the future we would like to you know, point finger at the player. Hey man, if you would have played more clever, you wouldn't destroy a church, you wouldn't destroy half of the village people would be able to return and live there after war. So we want people to think about this. You're welcome. More questions from the audience? So then, thanks again. Fantastic talk, and even will be available um, also in the red yeah in the fridge. Oh, by the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have questions, um, he will be next to the fridge. <laughs> yeah. But thanks so much, Ivan.